Up next, the story behind one of the bona fide classic songs of the 1970s, straight from the singer and songwriter, including an acoustic performance. This song has attracted every generation since its release. It's also conquered pop culture through its use in film and other medium. You're not gonna wanna miss this one. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. If you've ever sung to the top of your lungs, you know, whenever a certain song comes on the radio, you're gonna love this channel. Subscribe below right now and make sure to click the bell so that you never miss out on our daily features. Also, you can check us out on our Patreon link. It's our insider community, and we're gonna be releasing a new series there very soon. Not gonna to wanna to miss that. Now it's time for another edition of Revelations where iconic artists share the inside details behind their biggest songs. And this is a special edition of this series because uh, we have the in-depth story behind the 1972 Yacht Rock classic, Brandy, You're a Fine Girl, as told by Looking Glass lead singer and songwriter Elliot Lurie. This is uh, just one of the most interesting stories behind the song that I've experienced, and he performs an acoustic version at the end. As we go into this interview, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses that I jam every day. At zenny.com, you're able to shop according to the shape of your face, which guarantees that you always have a variety of really exceptional and distinctive eyewear that will always look great on you. Shop at zenny.com today, and here is Elliot with the story. Brandy's one of the first songs I remember hearing as a little kid, and that's one of the songs that got me into this crazy music thing, but it's just one of those songs that sticks, no matter how many times you hear it or how young you are, what age you are, it just is instant. And I read that you didn't like jump up and down when you wrote it, like, oh, this is a hit song. No, I mean, when I wrote it, it was, you know, it was written along with writing a lot of other things and I, and I liked it a lot. And I did find that whenever we played it for people, whether I played it just on the guitar, whether the band played it, it always got a really positive reaction, you know, relative to the other material. So we we definitely knew that it was, you know, one of the the good ones, one of the keepers. One of the greatest songs of the 70s and actually named the 11th greatest song of the 70s by CBS FM. Yeah, I think yeah, so. Just, just, just yeah. last summer. Yeah. But that went to number one for one week and it was behind <laughs> Gilbert O'Sullivan, yeah. Alone oh, Again, right, Naturally. Yeah. Yeah. Alone Again. And then Alone Again came in yeah. at number one again. Yeah. So you snuck in there for a week, but yes. of course it was such a massive song and spent 17 weeks on the charts. And 12th biggest song in 1972 is number one in Canada, number 10 in Australia. The inspiration for the song, tell me about that. Because I know that in that old farmhouse, yeah. you were playing along so, and, uh, and if the spirit moves you, we would this, love to hear some of the chords. This, by the way, yeah. is the same guitar that I wrote it on. I've wow. had this guitar since 1967. I bought it used. I don't really know what year it's from, probably 63 or so, but this, I've still got, still got it. Wow. So the way I would write is, you know, I just kind of noodled on some chords. And, you know, I get the chord progression going and you start singing along with it. So I had a, a high school girlfriend whose name was Randy with an R. And I'm just, uh, you know, singing along with that. And uh, once I got the story going, I said, well, Randy's not going to work because, first of all, it could be a boy or a girl. And as the story started to come together about a barmaid, I said, well, if it's a barmaid, it's got to be Brandy. So that's what happened. But when I wrote it, so the verse, which goes like this, I wrote on the guitar. And it's got, it's got uh, two changes every bar, so yeah. it's kind of busy. And I got to the chorus, and I want it to be uh, less busy. And I couldn't come up with a chorus on the guitar. Now, I told you we had that upright piano downstairs, and I was playing the guitar in my bedroom upstairs. So I went down to the piano for a while. And I could only play the piano in the key of C. And back then, the pianos didn't have the little switches on them that they have now that you can change the key on them. It was an acoustic piano. So I started playing a riff that was a real piano kind of riff because it's got a, a triad on top. And then it, the triad kind of stays the same, and it's just the bass note that changes. 
Good. So I'm played in C, which is that key, but in, in the right key, so it's like. But I didn't learn that. I was playing in a different key on the piano. So I got the chorus going on the piano. Like I go, Brandy, oh, fine, go. And then I would go back upstairs and take the guitar and play the next verse. And then I'd get to the chorus and I'd go back downstairs. It's the other key in the piano. Until I finally said, you know, schmuck, bring the guitar downstairs so you don't have to keep <laughs> running up and down. And I finally did it. And I, I, you know, I took the chords on the piano and put them up. So really, musically, the, the structure of the song is that the, the verse is kind of written on guitar and is busy. The bears the night of a man chord-wise, because there's two changes per bar. And then the chorus is written on the piano. And the bridge, and it's, uh, you know, it's much more open. Yeah. But the story is a, uh, you know, it's a made-up story. I just borrowed her name, but the story's made up. Yeah. So as you started to go into the verse and putting it together, writing the lyrics, you were just trying to tell a story. Yeah, I had, uh, in high school, I had written a lot of short stories. And in fact, you know, a couple of them won like little awards here and there. I was, pre I yeah. was pretty good at it for, for a high school student. And I liked it, you know, I liked that. And I especially liked the idea of trying to tell a whole story in like, you know, two minutes and 59 seconds, because a single can't, you know, back then it couldn't be more than two minutes. 59. Right, right. Matter of fact, Brandy is three minutes and four seconds, but on the label it says 2.59, because the DJs wouldn't play it if it was over three minutes. So it's very challenging to try to bring a whole narrative, rhyme it, put it in song structure, and do it in under three minutes. So I, I like that. Well, and of course, barmaid Brandy, busy in the western seaports and mm -hmm. serving hundreds of ships a day. <laughs> There's a girl in this harbor town and she works. And then the sailors flirt with her, right. but she's still holding out hope for that one. Right. They couldn't stay, no harbor was his home. It's just a great story. And there was the urban legend that there was a coincidence of somebody who was from New Brunswick that was... You know, I heard about that about five, ten years ago. <laughs> and, it, and if that part of the story is true, and I've seen it that, you know, it's historically documented, it is one of the wildest coincidences. No I kidding. didn't know about it until I read about it. I guess it came out about ten years ago, that story. Yeah. And I had never heard it before. So. Mary Ellis, it was a spinster yeah, 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 back yeah, yeah, yeah. in the 1700s or something like it's that. That's a very uh, interesting coincidence. That is. Yeah, yeah. And you guys recorded Brandy. You actually recorded a couple of times. Is that true, oh, Steve it Cropper? A, it was an adventure. First of all, we did like two, three different demos of it before we even got signed. And then uh, when we got signed to Epic, Clive suggested that we go down to Memphis and have Steve Cropper produce mm -hmm. us. So we thought that was great. We loved Steve Cropper. He's a legendary oh. cat. And, you know, going to Memphis. So we went down there. We cut four sides with him, including Brandy. And we were quite happy with them, and the experience was great. And we came back to uh, New York, and we had a meeting schedule. We were going to sit down with Clive and the A&R people. We were going to listen to the track, decide what's up, you know, what, how we go forward with the album. We went into Clive's office. We put on the tracks, and they sounded like really well-recorded versions of a pretty good bar band. Uh, they didn't sound like hit records. I mean, they were fine. They sounded like we did in a barn. They were well-recorded. and. We played it in time and in tune and everything, but they did sound like hit records. And, you know, as much as Clive did, we wanted a hit record. So Clive put us with a staff producer at Epic named Sandy Linzer. And Sandy, if you're out there and if you ever see this, thank you. You never got enough credit for that record, but you had a real impact on it. Uh, Sandy was an old school New York pop guy. He had worked with the Four Seasons. He was a staff producer at CBS. He knew how to make radio records. So he came out to our farmhouse in Huntington County and worked with us for a day, kind of changed the arrangement. We worked on the intro a little bit. We massaged this, we massaged that a little bit. Then he said to us, he said, you know, it's great. It's going to be a hit. I'd like to bring in my best session players to play on the track. And we were like, wow, no, 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 we, we can do this. And we actually had a fight a little bit with, with Clive and with Sandy, but we wound up playing on the track and Sandy uh, produced a rhythm track. But then he kind of took it too far. 
He had an idea for a ship's bell at the opening, a sound effect. He had a string and horn arrangement that uh, sounded really kind of late 60s New York pop, you know, which I liked late 60s New York pop, but it was 1972 and we were a little different than that. So about midway through the process, we stopped working with Sandy and we finished the record. So we did the vocals, the background vocals, we brought in the horn and string arrangement and all that kind of stuff. And that's the... Hey, Bob, Bob Lifton, right? Well, Bob Lifton was an engineer. Bob Lifton owned a studio on West 57th Street in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And he was a studio owner and a great engineer. He went on to be the engineer for Saturday Night Live for years and years and years. Passed yeah. away a few years ago. Uh, but he owned a studio. So it was kind of a hunt and peck kind of production. Bob was an engineer and he'd been around a lot of hit records. Our manager had a lot of input. And then the band just kind of experiment. Let's try this. Let's try that. Let's try yeah. this. And at the end of the day, it came out. Don't It Make You Feel Good was the single that came out. And then, of course, Harv Moore. We've got to talk about that. It's yeah. such a great story. I love these kinds of stories yeah. where if one thing wouldn't have happened a certain way, maybe things would be different. Yeah. But unnoticed until Harv Moore, which is DJ from Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. Yep. And Robert Mandel, Epic Records, yes. promotion manager, yes. received the test pressing, and he took it around to all the different stations, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, WPGC, AM and FM, and that was one of the leading top 40 stations yeah. in the nation. Yeah, it was a big top 40 station. And what's interesting is I learned afterwards, I didn't know it then, but apparently, I mean, Washington, D.C. was not a market that was known for breaking hit records. Philadelphia would be one or, or you know, Houston or Dallas. Mm -hmm. or, but Harv Moore was the DJ there. I never met Harv Moore to this day. Wow. But Robert Mandel, who I do know and I still see occasionally, went into Harv Moore and he said, uh, you know, he's pitching his records, he's a promotion man. He says, have you heard this looking glass thing? He's got the pre test pressing of the album with him. And Harv goes, yeah. He says, you know, we played that, don't it make you feel good a couple of times, but they're really not doing anything, you know. And Robert said to him, have you heard the rest of the album? Harv said, no. So Robert says, I got a test pressing here. There's one track I'd really like you to hear. And he puts on brand. And Harv says, yeah, I like that. So he takes the test pressing, puts it on the radio right then and there. And all of a sudden, the phones are lit up like a Christmas lit up tree. Like, as, as they say, <laughs> lit up like a Christmas tree. The phones are ringing and requesting it and over and over again. So he added it to the playlist. Back then, this Jackies could add it to their playlist yeah. and uh he said he'd never gotten a response like that from a song in well, like 15 years all i can tell you is three weeks later we went up to the epic records office on 52nd and broadway and we met with a couple of the executives there and they said well you're going to have a number one gold record and he only started playing it three weeks ago we said well how do you know that he said we know that when you get that kind of reaction in that market that's going to be a number one gold record and it was number one record immediately in Washington, D.C., but Barry Manilow actually changed the name of Mandy because, of course, it was first written Brandy. Yeah. How happy you made me, oh man. Well, you but because of the popularity of that song, he changed it to Mandy. Yeah, it was an interesting timing thing because those English fellows that had a hit with us with what became Mandy in Brandy in England before we came out with Brandy. We weren't yep. aware of that, and that, that record didn't cross over outside of England. So we had Brandy, and then at that point, when Barry Manilow was gonna do it, Clyde said, well, it can't be Brandy, because I just had a number one record with this other Brandy, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, and your vocal on it, too, is so distinct. You have a voice that's unlike anybody else's. It just got a certain timbre to it. I wanna ask you about the chorus, too, and singing it when you guys were recording, because you recorded it many different times, but coming up with the arrangement. I love the chorus, how you sing it. Brandy, you're fine, Okay, well, here's the story. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. And at the time that we recorded Brandy, I really hadn't sung in the studio that often. I mean, we'd done the demos, but you know, in a studio on a beautiful Neumann U67 microphone, you know, with it, I hadn't done it that often. So I went in the studio to do the first take of the vocal and I start singing it, you know, and I'm getting used to the sound and the headphones and a little bit of the echo and feeling the timbre in my voice is starting. I see how that works with the, with the microphone. And all of a sudden the playback button goes and it's our manager, Mike Gershman. He says, come in from it. I say, yeah. He says, it's sounding great, man. He says, but you can't sing there's a port on a Western Bay. You gotta lose that Brooklyn accent. It's not gonna work. 
So I became very conscious of it. So if you listen to the vocal, there's a couple of interesting things going on there. First yeah. of all, it's a guy who's still kind of experimenting with a great microphone in a great studio. Number two, it's a guy with a thick Brooklyn accent, overly accentuating his R's <laughs> so that there's a port on a Western, you know. And I guess the natural timbre of my voice, you know, a lot of people told me, oh, I thought, you know, I thought that was a black guy singing that, or I thought that was a Southern guy singing that, or God, you're such a little guy. I thought it was like a 220 pound guy singing that. Um, so I don't know, maybe the voice doesn't fit the, the image. But that, that I think the combination of the timbre of my voice, the fact that I was still really learning and, and enthralled by the studio setting, and most of all, the, the diction of trying to not sound Brooklyn and make sure everybody could hear every word. I think that kind of combined to make it a, a little unusual. Well, and the, also the background vocals. You guys just nailed those. It's got so much energy to it when you hear the do 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 it's one of those songs that there's only probably been 50 songs like this, but it should be illegal to turn the radio station when that <laughs> song comes on because it's just such a feel good well, song. You know, like, like I said, Alan, we, we wanted to have a hit record. Making that record was like we poured as much stuff as we could on it and then we like sort of took some off, you know, took some off. But we loved that background vocal. I mean, that kind of background vocals, they're partly influenced. Like, I love the, the impressions. We used to listen to the Rascals a lot. And we had a nice blend. Uh, Larry, the piano player, sang. Peter had a, a beautiful tenor, definitely a register and a half above yeah. mine. So when you hear that, those doo doos, it's Larry on the bottom in real voice then Peter in the middle in real voice, then me on the top in falsetto. Uh, we love that kind of stuff, you know. We, and the we, call and response, too. Such a fine yeah, girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a fine girl, fine girl. What a good wife you would be. Such a fine We worked that out, not in the studio. I mean, we, we worked that out in the house. And we used to, when we used to do it in the clubs, we did it that way. And it's just such a sing-along. The crowd wants to sing those parts. And again, well, we it's just a so feel-good song. We had so many different influences, but that... Brandy was influenced by that that kind of gene pool. I mean, we had a whole nother side, which is represented on that first album, that was much more influenced by people like Poco, and I mean, we used to listen to that kind of stuff too. So you know, there there were there were two, at least two sides to Looking Glass, maybe five sides for Looking Glass. <laughs> yeah. But this one was from that gene pool. Well, of course, it's been one of those songs that's been used in pop culture probably as much as any song from any decade. Lords of Dogtown, Say Anything, Charlie's Angels, which that was like the perfect <laughs> way how they use that. My lady is the sea. Very Brady sequel and Lime Life, but also The Wire. And that was probably pretty cool that they used it in what they consider to be one of the greatest TV shows of all time. Well, the, the thing that's interesting to me, and, and uh, I, I can't really put my finger on it, but there are certainly have been bigger hits from that same era that have not had the longevity right and as you say the uh the, the broad use in pop culture that brandy has now of course you know i feel very fortunate for that uh why that is i don't know maybe because it's a story song maybe it's because of the vocal maybe it's because because of the hunt and peck production where you know when you listen to other things from 1972 Okay, this is an R&B record, this is a pop record, this is a sort of folk rock record, but, but Brandy is kind of, partly because, you know, the Hunt and Peck production, it's like sort of falls in between, you know, it's not quite a grassroots record, uh, you know, it's not quite a, you know, it's not quite Blood, Sweat and Tears or Chicago, but it's, right. it's somewhere in there, you know? Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. Well, it's how the production is so perfect. It's great that you guys play the instruments because it really does sound like a wrecking crew or something like that. Yeah, well, that's I mean, part of it, too, because yeah. some of those big pop records from the early 70s, they were session guys. And nothing against session guys. I, I love them. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a session guy groupie. I love session right. guys. But not, not on our own records. We were a band. And that also is part of it. It's, it's a little bit like a... You know, you could still hear that it's like a really well-produced, well-rehearsed garage band at the end right, of the day, a right, bar band right. at the end of the day. And I think know? that's why people relate to it, because be. it's like it's, it's got, it's got, still got that... It's got personality. A, it's slick, but it's still got enough organic stuff Raw. in it that you can tell. 
these guys are really playing and singing it. And yeah, the horn section is slick and the mix is great and everything is cool, but it's still a bunch of guys playing and singing it. And sincere too. I mean, the way that you sing it, very, very sincere. And it's just, again, that energy. But another cool thing is in a movie from the 80s, it's getting a little bit more play now because of Ready Player One that just came out. It's a big box office thing, but Real Genius, the Val Kilmer movie from the 80s. They did an instrumental version. I was the music supervisor on Real Genius. So I, I should say I worked for the music supervisor. Yeah. It was one of the most one of the first films I worked on when I came to Hollywood and became a music supervisor was Real Genius. And you know, I mean, uh, uh, they needed a little background thing, and I, you know, I they stuck, I love they stuck that. it in there because <laughs> that's one of those little pop culture moments that you really have to be paying attention. But you hear it and you're like, Is oh my it gosh, really that's in there? I got to check my statements. I don't see that one come up. I got to yeah. check that. Thing. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but The Simpsons. Yeah. That was probably such an honor when well, Marge's I on that sister. Too. You know, I had a whole second career. So The Simpsons was part of that too. You know, and that was uh, you know Richard Sakai and uh, and the producers of uh, of The Simpsons. They thought it would be fun to do that. And, and yeah. Marge's sister yeah, sings Marge it to Lisa. My love and my lady is the sea. Poor Brandy. And then later in the Simpsons Family album, a book that came out a couple of years ago, Marge is talking in it in character and saying that. Oh, this is a song about our paternal grandfather or something <laughs> from his perspective. And and so it was name checked there. But then Doug sang it on King of Queens and oh, yeah, that was the karaoke cool. version. <laughs> my love, my lady, in the sea. That one I didn't I didn't sneak that one in. That one, <laughs> I did it under and then I don't know if you ever heard about Sarah Borges, who did the same old 45. She retells the story. No, of, I don't uh, know that. Yeah, you'll have to check that one out from her point of view. And then Paul Stanley of KISS yes. said that it inspired Hard Luck Woman. You ain't a hard luck woman. You'll be a hard that I have heard uh, often. And uh, I don't know Paul. Um, he actually couple, said it in his book. Yeah, we have a couple of mutual friends, but I, I heard that. And, uh, That's, that's cool. cool. Hey, man, you know, the great thing is especially since I grew up, I was a, like an avid listener and fan before I came up. A, a but I mean, you know, when you have something out there that influences other people to, to go, to, you know, to sort of borrow or whatever from that, that's fine. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Because you guys were influenced by like what you just talked yeah. about. All the, you know, especially in the, I won't say the pop world, but in the commercial, I don't think there's anything totally new under the sun, except maybe the Beatles, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Guardians of the Galaxy 2, if you could have picked the perfect way to use it in a movie and how many times it was used and introducing it to a whole new generation, my kids love this song. And, <laughs> and they, they heard me play it, of course, but when they saw it in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, that took it to a whole other level. It was just a great thing. I, you know, because I worked in Hollywood for a while, so I'm a member of the Academy and, every, and of, of motion pictures, people who vote on the Oscars, and every year they send out these video discs for you to watch so you love for them. And the year that I got the uh, first Guardians movie, it's not the kind of movie that I would normally go see at the theater, but I had heard such great things about it. I said, let me look at this. I put, I didn't really know about how they use the music or anything like that. Yeah. I just heard, this is really great. It's for, I put it on, I'm loving it, you know, I'm loving it. And then I'm loving the way they're using the 70s music in it. And it, it Honestly, I, I was a little jealous that they hadn't used Brandy because they used all these other great, you know, they used Come and Get Your Love. All these contemporary songs. I was like, damn, I wish they... So, okay. And then, like, you know, when the next one comes around, my publisher sends me this request for use in Guardians 2 without any specifics as to how they want to use it. I said, yeah. absolutely, by all means, you know. Uh, and then I spoke to James Gunn, who's the director. We, we connected by, by email a couple of times. And then he sent me the script pages. And I read the script pages. I said, well, this is not just like a background use or even like a montage. This is like part of the, this is unbelievable. Part of the story. It's part of the plot. Brandy, you're a fine girl. What a good wife you would be. Emailed back and forth yeah. with James, you know, he said, yeah, yeah, we're just, we're one I said, oh, okay, you know. And then the third step before the final movie came out is they sent me the clips of the movie to look at. And I was sitting there with my wife and, you know, we got it on email, we put it up on the thing. 
And when we started seeing the way it was used in the movie, it was like, whoa. You know uh, Brandy? By looking glass? You know, that's great. Because look, I th I, James Gunn is fantastic. His taste in music is great. Those movies are, are groundbreaking. I mean, you know, the first one was just, oh, yeah. you know, when you say there's nothing new under the sun, that, that first movie is just brand new. It's just fresh as can be. Second movie was great, too. My song's in it. I love it. <laughs> you know, but he carried on very well what he had established in the first movie, which was just fresh as could be. Well, what an honor, too, as you say, to have the first movie come out and have that soundtrack be so massive and introduce young people to 70s music that maybe haven't heard or just heard it on the radio and things. Hooked on a Feeling yeah. and then... Hooked on a Feeling, Blue Swede. 1973, that song belongs to me! And then, of course, fooled around and fell in love, yeah. which was great. And to have that in the stratosphere, and then to follow that up and make the main song be Brandy. I mean, yeah, well, you know, honor. But the, the way he used it is so is so interesting. And, you know, he's, he's so smart and, 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 and so clever, because the way he used it, you know, and, and this gets around to, uh, you know, this may have been the end of the conversation for you, so I maybe jump with the gun. But, you know, so when this character, uh, Kurt Russell's character. Ego. E Ego. Is talking to uh, his son and, and uh, you know, he explains to him, he says, well, it's Earth's greatest composition. He says, you know, because, because of the fact that, you know, the, the universe is, you know, he, he explains it in this very metaphorical way. Right. You know, it's a, a giant metaphor. Yes. You know, Peter, you and I, we're... We're the sailor in that song. And a little bit tongue in cheek, too. As a matter of fact, I went to the premiere, and when he utters that line, could be Earth's greatest composition, there were a few giggles for, for, from, the, from the Hollywood crowd, you know? So it's a little tongue in cheek, but that's, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, but what he says is great because he says one of Earth's greatest musical compositions, maybe it's greatest. I yeah, love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, know, you can't beat that. And I'm a big Kurt Russell fan, so, you know, whoever, but that was great. One of Earth's greatest musical compositions. Perhaps it's very greatest. Yeah, yes. Anyway, my, my point being that, you know, he treats it as this, as this great metaphor. And in retrospect, you know, it kind of is. And it's, but when I wrote it, if it was a metaphor, it was subconscious. It was just a story for me as I was writing it. Now, in retrospect, 50, 45 years later, it was probably something out there with the same kind of metaphorical intent that James Gunn has in the movie, which is, you know, whether it's ego wanting to control the universe or whether it's a sailor who's got to get back on his boat. Any male who is self-absorbed at the point where his trip, whether it's the ocean or the universe or the music business or whatever it is, they're not ready for a full-on romantic commitment because they're aware enough to know that they're fully absorbed with their own uh, quest at that moment. The sea calls the sailor back. He loves the girl, but that's not his place. Now, did I think that when I wrote it at 21 years old? Not a bit. Was it in the background? Who knows? Now, looking back on it, though, you can go, hmm. <laughs> But so many great covers of it, too. Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yeah. To have the Red Hot Chili Peppers cover it a couple times. I mean, they've performed it live. And, and then Kenny Chesney. There's a big difference between those two people. But. There is. But, you know, it's not, it's not one of the most, I mean, it's not a, a, a heavily covered song for a song that's been as popular. I mean, I know the guy who wrote, You are so beautiful oh, to yeah. me. You are so beautiful. You know, when you look that up, there's like a hundred artists who have covered that. There's maybe like six yeah. know, artists who have covered Brandy. The Chili Peppers version is great because it kind of sounds exactly the way we used to do it on a good night at a bar. <laughs> yeah. The Kenny Chesney version is cool because it's very faithful to the, to the record. But it's got just enough of the, his beach vibe and his country vibe, and he's a great singer. The, I really like I really like uh, the Kenny Shedd version. Well, of course, Ray Conniff and his singers <laughs> covered that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we can't lose that. You weren't yeah, gonna, yeah, you yeah, gonna yeah, get yeah. away from here without yeah. me bringing that one up. My favorite version has become your acoustic version. I love that. Where'd just you, you and your guitar. 
It's actually on Spotify. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, I put it up there. I, I love it. I did it. I had that whole separate career in, in Hollywood, but now, the last few years, I've gotten back to playing. And I do, you know, some shows where it's like singer songwriter shows, where it's just me and a guitar, and I, you know, play the songs. And I both. Yeah, so I put it down one night, and that's, that's kind of the way I wrote it. You know, it's kind of with yeah. the car, guitar. Once I learned the piano chords on the guitar, yeah, it's kind of the way I wrote it. It brings uh, new layers to it. When you can play a song and you can sing it a little bit more methodically and just kind of bare bones, it really brings new nooks and crannies to the song, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It just deepens it, and I just love that. It's interesting because with all of the production things that made it such a popular record and, and maybe that, that keep it hanging on, and uh, uh, I, I mean, I'm very proud of the record. It, it was a very interesting pop record for its time, different, obviously, the, the fact that it's, uh, you know, stood the test of time uh, stands to that. But when I play on guitar, you know, it all, it still works, the vocal kind of works, the chord changes work, the story certainly works, tells the whole story. And well, it used to be 259. At the tempo that I do it now, it's about 345. <laughs> but it still tells the story in a brief amount of time. I don't mind singing it if my voice hits it. Okay. I mean, the way, the way I do it, in closed, I use the electric. It's like... Slower when I do this. Yeah, it's not very good. There's a port on a western bay, and it serves a hundred ships a day. Along the sailors pass the town away and talk about their home. And there's a girl in this harbor town, and she works. Laying whiskey down, they say brandy, fetch another round. She serves them whiskey and wine. Say, I said brandy, you're a fine girl. What a good wife you would be. But my life, my love of my lady, is the sea. Yeah. That's kind of how it sounds. Oh, it? man, I love that. Thank <laughs> you so much for sharing that. What a treat, man. That's amazing. Hey, thanks for watching. Really under the weather right now, but doing my best. Leave us a comment about this amazing song, about this, this, uh, this 70s classic. What are your memories uh, of the song and of these movies? Please share with us. If you like our content, we do invite you to be a permanent part of our community by subscribing below. Now to get this music on vinyl or CD, click our links below and make sure to check us out on Patreon for that new series. Help us keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Stay safe out there. <laughs>